Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Poets Respond Live, our Sunday morning news show exploring current events through the lens of poetry. So glad you could join me as always. Um, and this is mostly an open mic show, so if you're new, let me tell you how it all works. First thing you have to do is email the poem that you would like to read, if you haven't already submitted it through Submittable, to openmicatrattle.com. Let me put those uh, that, that up on screen for you right here. Um, email openmicatrattle.com if you'd like to share... Um, if you'd like to share your poem that way, if you haven't yet, if it's through Submittable, though, I can show it on Submittable. Um, and then what you do is call in to 818-850-7727. That's 818-850-7727. Just let it ring a few times, then hang up, and I will call you back when the time is right. The other option is to use Skype and just send me a chat message to rattle poetry, all one word. I'll wave back, and um, then I'll call you up when the time is right. We just go, this is how we do our call-in list for the open mic, so um, I'll do it in the order that was received. So far we have Nivedita Karthik, Jared Lacey would like to share a poem, um, Caitlin Spees is here, well Caitlin's going to be uh, the poet on Tuesday, so we have a preview of that poem too, and then uh, Jessica, um, Jessica, I don't see a last name, but Jessica's here too, um, so we will um, share those poems, uh, but call in right now if you'd like to participate and get in line for the open mic. Now today's poem that we published um, was My Name in Audible, and um, a sort of meta-modernist poem, a, a, a remix of found poetry here. And let's call up the author of, um, of My Name in Audible. It's Patricia Mona Ang. Let's, let's uh, get her on the line right now. Hello. Hey, Patricia, this is Tim with the Rattle. You are live on the air on Poets Respond Live. Hi, Tim. How are, are you? you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you doing today? Pretty good, thanks. Um, so, so to start out, do you want to just explain a little bit of what, about what inspired you to write this poem? I mean, it's an it's a event, of course, everybody knows what's going on, but maybe you just offer your perspective on it? Sure. Um, well, I was inspired to write this poem because I was just, like everyone else, horrified by the uh, spa shootings. And um, as an Asian American woman, it just felt very personal. Um, mm -hmm. When they first happened, I was reading everything I could find about them online. I found a lot of information about the shooter that was very detailed, um, actually sympathetic, and that humanized him. Little details like he played drums in high school and, and likes pizza, but I could not find any info on the victims. And even as time passed, no info on the Asian women who were killed. Um, at the time of my writing the poem, some of the Asian women had still not uh, been named in the news, uh, almost as if they had not really existed or were invisible. Um, uh, so that was my inspiration. Um, there uh, are two voices in the poem, um, um, and um, so it's it's a contrapuntal. Um, I um, the first voice is the voice of the shooter, um, which is written as a first person description, um, and it's pieced together from quotes from a high school yearbook, uh, quotes from friends and ex roommates, um, his Instagram account, um, and I also made use of quotes from an official from the um, Cherokee County Police Department who had unfortunately described the shooter as having a bad day and being fed up. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other voice um, was um, the caller from Gold Spa in Atlanta, and I incorporated the transcript of the 911 call um, using the words of the caller, leaving her words in exact order with no words added or left out, exactly as she spoke them to the dispatcher. You know, I was very concerned about using a 911 transcript, and I tried to use it with a lot of care and respect. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just couldn't find anything about these women, not even their names, while I was writing. And I found the transcript online and listened to the audio 
um, and uh, um, and read the transcript uh, before I even thought of writing anything. I just felt compelled to reread the transcript and re-listen to the audio just as a way, you know, to be with the caller um, in the last few moments of her life, uh, to to be a kind of witness. Um, because the call represented her last few moments when she had a voice. So um, in the poem, I wanted to give the caller her voice so she isn't silent, silent or invisible. And I wanted readers to also witness um, what happened to her using her own words. Um, so I did a fair amount of work on the juxtaposition of the two voices line by line um, so that um, the victim's voice seems to respond to what the shooter says. Um, and you can see in the poem that, in a sense, she's uh, talking back to the shooter. Um, and you can see in some lines where the shooter uh, speaks about it not being about race or about wanting to eliminate or kill. Uh, for example, the, sh- the caller's response is, yeah, that's why. And, and those are her exact words from the transcript so um yeah yeah it's a great great explanation of of what the poem's doing thanks so much for sharing that and um and it's true i looked up after you set this poem in i tried to find you know how much information between the time that you submitted it and um yesterday afternoon when i was reading it and there's nothing more there's names and, and ages and that's all i could really find so um it still continues even probably on Sunday too to not not be representative of that and and for the poem just the the juxtaposition of these two voices is, is chilling is the word that people keep saying on the emails as they reply to it this morning and um, it really is a haunting chilling sort of way to be in that that terrible moment um, have you yeah. I wanted to ask if you've if you've used this uh, this is reminds me of the the modern meta modernist movement kind of um, that that school of of remixing poems, um, and in in art from from found sources, is that something that you do often, or is this something that you just um, is this the first time you've done it? Because um, it's a really really wonderful example of that as as far as how it's put together. Yeah, I um, this is actually my first attempt at that, and um, uh, it just um, maybe it was just because I was so inspired, but um, um, it it seemed to come together um but it it did uh take some you know moving around of the text and um in in terms of the uh description um the first person description of the shooter um and just um you know as i said um going through line by line um t- and working on that juxtaposition of the two voices mm-hmm. um cuz i i wanted her voice to be heard, you know, um, and I wanted her experience to be known. Um, they, they, as I said, um, there whether wasn't anything out there to really speak for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. do you want to go ahead and read the poem again for, for the audience now? Sure. Um, okay. um, my name, Inaudible. I go by my middle name, Aaron. I played drums, whispering, when I was at Sequoia High, 1916 Piedmont Road. It's definitely an outlet, yeah. If I'm angry or something, cold spa, I go down to my drum set, inaudible, and start hitting stuff right now. It just helps. So can help me come. My friends say 1916 Piedmont Road. I am super nice, super Christian, huh? A deeply religious person, I don't know, and very quiet, inaudible. I would walk around school, that guy, with a Bible, that's why. Need police, pizza, guns, Drums, music, yeah, family, and God, whispering. This pretty much sums up my life, old spa. It's a pretty good life, old spa. I was saved at Crab Apple First Baptist Church, 
in audibles. They are all praying for me now. Sorry. Just before it happened, thank you. My parents kicked me out, hiding right now. And so I was emotional, that's why. You can believe me when I say they have a gun. It was not about race, inaudible, that's why. I just wanted to eliminate, yeah, inaudible, that's why. Temptation, um, this is Gold Spa. And I was pretty much fed up this spring and had been kind of, I don't know, at the end of my rope. I'm hiding right now. And yesterday was just, oh yeah, a really bad day, inaudible for me. I don't know. And this is just, please come, what I did. Okay? My name, inaudible, whispering. Thank you. Please. Well, Patricia Monang, thanks so much for sharing that poem. Um, just so, so powerful. Um, and just a wonderful example of, um, of what poetry can do. So thank you for sharing that today with everybody. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, have a good day. Oh, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. So it's Patricia Monang with today's, Mona Eng with today, today's poem, uh, My Name in Audible. Um, and now let's call up, we have another poem that we published this week, or we're going to be publishing. Um, and let me look over, we have some new callers in. Um, someone under Cerulean Blue 1, we have you, uh, Stephanie Russman, that is. Stephanie Russman Block. We have Mike Bales, we have an 857 number, so we'll get to, oh wait, no, that was uh, that was just uh, Patricia right now. So we have a list of at least 10 people so far. So if you'd like to call in, please um, don't hesitate to do so. The numbers are up there one more time. Um, Rattle Poetry over Skype or phone number 818-850-7727. And that is how you join. Now let's go to um, the other poet that we have coming up. Caitlin Spees is here. And let me, uh, let me call up Caitlin and we'll get her poem, which was... Um, Jogging after the Vatican resolves the dubium, does the church have the power to give the blessing to unions of persons of the same sex? Um, Caitlin, how are you doing? Hey, uh, pretty good. How, how are you? I'm doing great. So we have you on audio, but not video. If you want to come on video, click the camera button uh, between sure. the hang up uh, and the... Yeah, there you go. Let me see you that. Okay, cool. Yeah, hello. Sorry. So nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so do you want to introduce like what inspired your poem, what you were writing about this week? Yeah, so um, I think on Monday last week, um, I happened across a news story saying that um, I guess the Catholic Church, there'd been a question of like whether they could give like a blessing to same-sex couples. Mm -hmm. um, and their decision was no um, for very technical reasons, which are absolutely not surprising considering the Catholic, Catholic Church. And originally I just didn't want to think about it. Um, but then, I don't know, I just kept going over and over and over it. And I don't know, being frustrated <laughs> about it. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, sort of, I was surprised by the way that I was disappointed. Um, and then, yeah. Yeah. It must be, I mean, the new Pope, um, it, it seems sort of progressive for a pope, you know, and so it, it seems like it's sort of I don't I mean not as a Catholic and so not not being involved in the in the Catholic Church at all, but just from the outside it seems like some even more like um I don't know emotionally difficult to deal with the sort of inconsistencies of being you know more progressive and moving in some directions but not others. Like it seems like kind of a slap in the face almost maybe that that yep. you know that. I don't know. I mean, and, and the, the thing about, I don't know, I don't want to go on about it, but the thing about the Catholic Church, it seems like the the progression is, like, obvious. Like, it's not going to not happen eventually, <laughs> you know? And so what is the, I don't know. I mean, a lot of things, the same with the political environment with same-sex marriage here back in the, you know, 20 years ago when Democrats were denying it too, you know? I mean, I don't know. Um, what What is it like to be a Catholic and, and have the, that conflict, you know, is it something that you, 
that you struggle with all the time or is it something that, that you don't think about much? How, how does that work? So I'm sort of a weird Catholic. Like I, I went to Catholic school mm-hmm. um, and so I have a fair grounding in it, I think. But mm-hmm. And I still think of myself as Catholic. I mean, I don't currently go to church because pandemic, but before that I used to. Um, and I think I will when it's a thing again. Um, but it... I think I'm in a weird place where for me it's for me the church has been more than not a force for good in my life. Mm-hmm. And so part of, part of me feels like if enough of us love it hard enough maybe it'll figure itself out. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, I guess be less I mean I I, yeah, I guess for me, the way it, the, the line it's taking feels pretty close minded. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, that frustrates. I think that frustrates a lot of people. Um, and it. Yeah, so I, I think weirdly, I'm. Yeah, I'm frustrated with the church, but sort of from a place of caring about it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot which, of sense. Yeah, and it, that kind of comes through in the poem, too. And you wrote several poems this week about <laughs> it, which is... I'm sorry. Always, no, no, that's great. It, it's so it's so cool to see different angles and how... Um, I think this one works just so well because it's so... You kind of you kind of let yourself go with it or something, and it, and it goes in, like, strange, surprising directions. And uh, it's just a wonderful poem, so I'm so glad we could share this with everybody. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit about your about how you came to this poem as the one that sort of works the most? Like, was this the last one you wrote or the first one you wrote? I'm kind of curious. So it, it started as all one poem, mm-hmm. and then it just kept going in different directions, and I kept going back and being like, okay, I don't think this actually fits with the rest of it, but I still want to say it, so I guess I'll just make that its own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one was weird. Like I, so I, I started with the ending because I sort of thought of the ending for something else like months ago. And then this happened. It was like, oh, that's, that's what that ending was waiting for. Um, and so then I just, over the course of the week, just kept working towards it and kept like getting somewhere and then getting distracted and wandering off and coming back and being like, oh, wait, that doesn't work. I'm going to go a different direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I don't know if that answers the question. But... No, no, it definitely does. Well, do you want to go ahead and read it for everybody now? For sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, put it on where... screen. You'll have to have it on your own uh, your own computer or whatever, but... Yeah, it's definitely here somewhere. There it is. Okay, cool. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Um, jogging after the Vatican resolves the dubium, does the church have the power to give blessing to unions of persons of the same sex? The paths I love, my lord are narrow and switchbacked, and I'm puffing my way up them, parsing my disappointment. Today the Vatican confirmed that the church cannot bless the unions of persons of the same sex, because they say that blessing treads too close to sacrament for comfort, and moreover, sex divorced from procreation is still apparently a sin. Rattlesnakes drowse on the trails I love, Lord, and I knew I wasn't suicidal anymore when I accidentally stepped between a knotted pair napping in the dust. The diamond band of their backs pressed my brainstem, even before I parsed them into snake, into threat. But here's a miracle. Once I understood, I still gasped, oh shit, and pounded away. The seat belts and bike helmets came back later. Lord, I thought the rattlesnakes were going to be metaphors. I thought that next I'd bring up my mild familial allergy to apples just in case the imagery wasn't blatant enough already. But Lord, I loved the woman who ran these trails with me. I didn't know I loved her. It ended badly. And the way that I love, Lord, is narrow and branching and switchbacked. And Lord, I love you. Lord, I will not let you go. Bless me. Let me bless you. Yeah, Caitlin Spies, thanks so much for sharing that. The 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 love and disappointment kind of that combination just comes out so strongly in that poem. So thanks so much for, for sharing that and joining us today. Yeah, no, for sure. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. And it'll go up for everybody else uh, not watching this on uh, Tuesday. So looking forward to that. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. Okay, bye. bye. It was Caitlin Spies with uh, Jogging After the Vatican Resolves the Dubium. Just church... Does the church have the power to give the blessing of unions of persons of the same sex? Um, 
And let's see, who should we go to first? We have um, yeah, Carlton Johnson sent a poem. We have Nivedita Karthik. Let's do um, let's do uh, Jared Lacey. Say, so let's do Nivy. Let's do Jared Lacey. And uh, let's do Nivy first. Hey, Nivedita, how you doing today? I'm doing great. And we got a new camera or something, too. Uh, I just switched to my iPad because you always <laughs> seem to find it difficult with me on my phone. So No, it's no problem. It's just a quicker quicker transition. It's kind of nice. Um, so so um, what poem do we have for you? Quincy the cat plays uh, ping pong, and he can probably whoop your tail, too. That's hilarious. <laughs> and okay. there's a short video with it as well that people can watch if they want to, yeah, as always. I can, I can, yeah, let me see if I can. Uh, there may be an ad blocker in the beginning. I'll try. I'll, I'll play. I'm gonna have to do every. It's a new website every time. I have to disable the the ad blocker. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> um, so how did you find? How do you find these stories? First of all, I Google weird news stories, random news <laughs> stories, and funny news stories. Uh-huh. And then so the top three websites, HuffPost gives weird news stories. Mm-hmm. Of course, writers does. And then there's this third website called UPI. So these three have some really odd stories that are there, that are fun to read also. Like, in fact, UPI this time, when I Google this, like the entire listing was goats. Like there was a goat that chased cars in Nevada last week that was caught. Mm-hmm. And then there was now being adopted by somebody. And then there was a goat somewhere in the UK that was now tormenting joggers. And I was like, wow, like seriously. And then a cat that was rescued up from a tree and then fed spaghetti by the firemen. It's just all over the place. And it's so hard to pick one random news story Mm. that is actually funny and that fits. So that's so fun. Well, we'll watch this. Let's watch this cat playing ping pong for a second. Here we go. Um, So you can't see it, but here's the cat. That cat is actually pretty good. (laughs) <laughs> I think that's a and net, net, that it's net violation. Its it doesn't even have a ping pong pad. Yeah. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> so there's Quincy the cat playing ping pong. And mm-hmm. um, let's uh, let's see the poem. The poem is um, Quincy 1, Human 0. Why don't you go ahead and read it whenever, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Quincy 1, Human 0. Cats are striped. Cats are white. Cats are black. Cats are spry. Spry? Spry on their paws, I mean. Take Quincy here, for instance. He jumps and always lands on his feet. But he is not so spry to attempt the Viennese waltz. Place him on the table, and then you're in for a treat. Watch in wonder as he waltzes across the table, expertly smacking the ball across the net. No fancy paddle for this player cloaked in sable. Give him free rein on his paws, and he is set. If you're not careful, he can whoop your tail while not working up a sweat. Because cats don't sweat per se, you see. All in all, Quincy is your best bet in case you ever need a doubles partner. Because he will be the smartest ping pong player yet. Quincy one, human zero. (laughs) Excellent. Nivedita, thanks so much for sharing that. It's always so much fun having a a fun poem to do. I appreciate it. (laughs) Thank you, Tim. It's lovely talking to you too. Yep, Yep. have a good night. Have a great Sunday. Yep, bye. Thank you. (laughs) Bye. So it was Nivedita Karthik with Quincy One Human Zero. Let's call up uh, Jared Lacey now. I'll have to find the poem, so hang on a second. Right. Hey, Jared, this is Tim with Randall. You are live on the air. Um, how are you doing uh-huh. today? I'm doing great. How about yourself, Tim? I'm so I'm I'm doing great. I'm so glad you could call in. Um, and what was the uh, poem that you shared? It was Brown Water, right? Is that what you want to read? It's that is correct. Yeah. So so why don't you let everybody know what the story is about? Um, uh, yeah. This is this is this is a trigger poem. I, I was due to a story that I'm sure some of your uh, viewers probably heard about it. About uh, this this comes out of a, a North Little Rock, Arkansas, where a teacher had the audacity to force a five-year-old student to unclog a toilet with his bare hands. So you can only imagine how 
anyone, any par- any good parent would feel about hearing something like that. Yeah, I think uh, there might be, I don't know, I don't even want to say what, what, what I would do to the teacher if one of my kids came yeah, home with that exactly. story. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, it's, I couldn't even believe it. Like, I, uh, yeah. I what? Yeah. <laughs> that was my reaction. Yeah, I, I, I know my thought was on every parent, like what is every parent who heard about this? What are they thinking? Are they as infuriated as I am? And even though I'm not a parent, I was a makeshift one, you know, helping raise my brothers and sisters and mm-hmm. other kids. But, you know, but still, it's not the same as being an actual parent. But I was nonetheless, you know, you know, triggered again by it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't you go ahead and read this? This is Brown Water. Thanks so much uh, for doing so. No problem. All right. Brown Water. The air mute or wind will be the worst beaten whenever cruelty clawed what could have been simply solved. Say it to all fathers, but mostly to all mothers, the first teachers. They would, they would have become fire crackling throughout the sky, their screams multiplying what Vesuvius did by burning and burying everything and everybody beneath ash and black that risked spite and underestimation. It would not have been my child. It never would have been mine, child. The other access to the sewer is just as rank and hazardous as the manhood hole le- le- leading to it. Nasty lady, filthy so-called educator. Surely you've heard of a plunger, bleach, a drain opener, or snake, a janitor you should have summoned to cure a malfunction that keeps water flow in the race and stayed clear of the irony of young black hands on clogging white porcelain. And that was brown water and thank you guys so much for letting me read this yeah yeah thanks for for reading that and bring that to my attention too i hadn't heard that story and i was just i could not believe it and i'm glad you could call yeah. in because it was one of the poems i was thinking about um until you know other events happened and, and things happened but it was a I, I, great poem thanks for sharing I'm, no problem understandable and you have a great day yeah you too bye jared bye-bye it was jared lacy from uh huntsville alabama with uh, brown water Let's see, who do we have next? Um, let's see. I don't think Jessica has a poem today. Let's do Stephanie Russman Block. And let me say, um, I think I've got to remind for new people that uh, there is a delay. So if I uh, call you over Skype or the phone, hang up or X out, don't hang up, X out of uh, your YouTube stream or Facebook or YouTube or Periscope or wherever you're watching this, just at least mute that or just turn it off altogether because otherwise there's a delay of a f- several seconds. Actually, it looks like on um, Periscope, there's not much of a delay at all, but um, on other platforms, there's a lot of a delay. So uh, so make sure you X out so you don't get confused because you'll be talking to like the past me and the future me at the same time and, and that doesn't go well. So... Um, yeah, feel free to uh, to do that so you, so you don't get confused. And let's call up the next poet, um, which was Stephanie Russman Block. <clears throat> Hello. Hey, Stephanie, you are live on the air. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. And uh, did you want to turn the camera on or just leave it off? Um, I can just leave it off. Okay, cool. Um, so what is the um, uh, poem you wrote? What was the story that inspired it? Sure. Um, this was reflecting on the fact that it's been one year that we've been in the pandemic. So there were a lot of stories about and that it's been a year. Um, a few days ago, it was the anniversary of the first death in the state that I live in, which is Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was inspired to write this because I sort of couldn't believe it's been a year. I feel like I've really lost sense of time. And that's what this is about. Um, I'll say that professionally, I'm a psychologist and a scientist. So I've been working from home. And this talks about doing that simultaneously with raising um, my one year old son who turned one days before the pandemic and now is two. So that's Mm -hmm. what's reflected in here. Yeah, it's amazing to think it's been a year. And and, and so a year of these Poets Respond live shows too, actually. We started it because we were getting so many submissions, um, you know, during the pandemic, right when the lockdown was happening, everybody was kind of both had time to write, you know, poems because they were stuck inside and uh, a lot of emotional thoughts and, and energy too was going on. So we had a, over a thousand submissions every week for a while. And that's why we started this um, Poets Respond Live show. So it's been a year for that too. What a, what a, what a crazy year it's been. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's great. And I think that that reflects that too, that there's been so many great things that I think have come out of something so sad. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's hear it. They, they say it's been a year. I'll put it up okay. on the screen for everybody at home. Yeah. They say it's been a year since COVID began to soar and all the hatred in the world was just too hard to ignore. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. How does one know that time has passed at all when every single day has the exact same protocol? They say it's been a year since I've touched the handle of any doors. I wonder what it feels like for germs to seep into your pores. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. 6.30, I wake up, work, play, and eat. 9.30, lights out, lather, rinse, repeat. They say it's been a year since work clothes we once wore. Just please wear pants when we Zoom. That's all I ask for. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. Are Mondays Tuesdays or Tuesdays Mondays? It's pretty hard to keep track. The only way to know for sure is to consult the farmer's almanac. They say it's been a year since any in-person tour. We're all claustrophobic in a room with more than four. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. When my son turned one, the world was far less troubled. I only know that time has passed because his age has doubled. They say in a year, all of this will just be lore. I wonder what I'll think of this in 2024. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. In August, I finished one job. In September, I started another. But because I work from home, I sit at the same desk, no other. They say it's been a year since I entered the grocery store. How am I supposed to tell chunk light from solid albacore? They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. I've never been in person to my own office at work. I've heard it has a window, which was supposed to be a perk. They say it's been a year, but maybe it's been more. Was this the election year with Democrat Al Gore? They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. Some of my coworkers I've never met in person. If they have legs or not, I really can't be certain. They say it's been a year that I've been doing all my chores. I even bought a bona mop that I used to scrub the floors. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. Going to CVS has become such a thrill. No, really. They have toys and clothes and all kinds of pills. They say it's been a year since I really once swore we could live without internet now and forevermore. In hindsight, that judgment was just plain poor. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. As I look around the house, I see objects bought at here or there, places I vaguely remember, a dream as volatile as air. They say it's been a year, but really, who's keeping score? Maybe those who've experienced a COVID encore. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. Both funerals and birthdays I have attended from my living room couch, not the purpose it was intended. They say it's been a year since I've put my arm around yours. I miss your warm embrace. Oh, how humanity endures. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. While this poem sounds morose, I've learned a lot this year. Positives come with negatives, complementary hemispheres. The world ebbs and flows, expands and contracts. We breathe in, we breathe out, we invent, we adapt. I've taken a few risks and seen things in new light. I'm realizing that decisions are not just wrong or right. I've done eight jigs jigsaw puzzles, saved 900 bucks in gas, Finally, we can breathe, exclaim the sky and the grass. I get to share an office with my partner for life, and I never get tired of being husband and wife. I've read more books this year than I have since fifth grade. Thank goodness for audiobooks where words can be played. I've connected with relatives I didn't know I had, played games over Zoom, that's the new fad. I've walked around my block a million and one times, which has given me the space to compose these rhymes. I'm a stay-at-home mom. Well, not quite. I have a full-time job that I manage to spite. I'm my own personal trainer, hairdresser, housekeeper. I'm a scientist, therapist, and nursery school teacher. Nevertheless, I was busier still before the pandemic made us all ill. I'm grateful to not be running all around, driving an hour to work, and getting tightly wound. 
Finally, a respite from the chaos of my mind. When the outside slows down, I can follow in kind. We see what's important when push comes to shove, and above all else, the power of love. Death makes one live more fully to honor those who've passed prematurely. What we believe and truly think becomes illuminated when we're pushed to the brink. Fear of missing out is now long gone, as there isn't much left to miss out on. Only the little joys and subtleties of a year gone by much too quickly. They say it's been a year, and all I implore is wear a mask, get vaccinated, so society we can restore. They say it's been a year. I don't know what a year is anymore. Well, thanks, thanks for sharing that, Stephanie. Uh, that really gets everything in there. Uh, the whole year, such a such a such a such a year, <laughs> and so many great lines. My favorite, I think, I loved um, the one about um, oh, where did it go? I can't I can't find it anymore. But but the one about oh, where is it? Yeah, I can't find it anymore. But uh, there's some great lines in there. Thanks so much for sharing that, Stephanie. And, and before you go, I want to ask one thing. Um, you know, being a psychologist, how how long do you think that it will take to readjust back to normalcy? Like I noticed um, that that I don't look people in the eye anymore. To my sort of horrification when I realized that, like when people wear masks, somehow I've learned. Maybe I think it might be because there's no like facial cues, so it's like uncanny and i don't know but but i like look off in the distance as i'm talking to people um so for things like that do you think that we'll we'll get back to normal or do you think there's like permanent change in the way we interact with each other like could society be shifting because of it or will we just go back to the old ways um that's a great question i i have a few things i think i could say about that i would say that really uh, humans and all species are very adaptable we're Mm -hmm. very flexible and So I think it feels like things are very permanent and we will always be this way. But I imagine that we will adapt to whatever the new normal is quicker than we think. Mm -hmm. And um, nevertheless, um, we will carry some of this with us. And so it's not like it will always be gone. It certainly may trigger some kind of shift, like you said, in society. But I think that just like we adapted to covid happening and having to do things in this format that happened pretty quickly Mm -hmm. yeah yeah well well thanks uh thanks for sharing that and thanks for sharing that poem yep thanks so much yep bye yes once again that was stephanie rusman block with they say it's been a year um who do we have actually we have mike bales and um let me put the numbers on the screen if you'd like to call in. There's going to be time for, for more people than we have, I think. So if you'd like to call in still, the numbers are up there, 818-850-7727, or uh, send me a chat message to Rattle Poetry over Skype. And uh, let, let me read. This is, uh, this is um, click on this, redirecting you to NASA. This is uh, um, Carlton Johnson's poem. And this is a press release, I think, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And let's show the article first. Another first, uh, Perseverance captures the sounds of driving on Mars. Maybe I can play that. Let's see. Get some stuff. Here we go. If I can play this. There must be sound in this article, right? This is not a, this is just a picture. There must be this. Here's the sound. Okay, let's, let's listen to the sound of Perseverance driving on Mars. Come on, start. Oh, geez. Send me the SoundCloud. Okay, maybe SoundCloud will have it. Here it comes. Oh, my audio is not working. Let's see. Properties. Okay, here we go. So here is the sound we're talking about. Oh, there's a dog on Mars. No, just kidding. There's no dogs on Mars. That's my dog. This, this is the sounds of Perseverance, Mars rover driving on Mars. That is some interesting sounds. Okay, let's hear what um, let's hear what 
Carlton Johnson did with these sounds. Scratchy tunes, he calls it. And here we go. This is, I'll, I'll read it for Carlton here. Scratchy tunes. Recently, NASA relayed eerie sounds from Mars. Screechy, scratchy sounds resounded. Many alien fingernails on old slate chalkboards. While many wanted to run and hide, NASA engineers put on their headsets, grabbed a big cup of joe, got busy with the task at hand, trying to decipher these scratchy, coarse tones. Perhaps it was just the underside of the robotic carriage, scraping and scratching on the iron-laden rocks underneath. Or perhaps Perseverance always wanted it to be in its heart of hearts, to be a DJ. The first DJ on Mars, scratching records on turntables, fashioned from the ochre stones, from dried-out canyons and bones of undiscovered ancestors, screaming and shouting as Percy the DJ scores the highest gig in the world. Who knows, perhaps even now he's communicating with millions of Martians, sending out batches of scratches and super, superb reverbs, fade-ins and fade-outs to the masses, cheering loudly in a pitch only Percy can hear. I love that, sending out batches of scratches. Uh, thanks for sharing that. It was Carlton Johnson with Scratchy Tunes. And um, I don't know if this was something that, that Percy came up with that we didn't know about, or if... Um, if it's just some old news that that just serves, but I didn't know until this week that um, the red the red dust on Mars, the red color that you know it's the red planet, it's only a few millimeters thick. It's a layer of dust that sort of coats everything, but underneath it's not red at all. It's just the iron laden dust and that little layer from all the dust storms that they have. Um, so underneath it would look much more like rocky Earth soil, apparently. Um, let me, so next caller is going to be Mike Bales. Let me get his uh, poem thrown into a Word document really quick so you don't get his, uh, don't dox him. And let's call it Mike Bales now. Let me get his uh, poem up for everybody while we do that. Um. This is Mike. Hey. Um, I'm going to move away from the phone for you. How are you? <laughs> no problem. How are you doing today, Mike? Pretty good. Uh, nice day. Yesterday I was battling my laptop today. Today I was battling the printer to print out the <laughs> thing I wrote for you. <laughs> yeah, those computers, man. I, I, my computer updated. It just messed up everything. And I get some error message yeah. every time Every time I, I open any window. So i got to figure out what that's about. But anyway, so what were you writing about today, um, Mike? The station is the poem. Well, this... This was written after the things in the prompts were, were written, a mm -hmm. dystopic poem. Um, somebody asked, I think, what a flagger was. I was a flagger, a traffic control guy with the stop slow sign guy. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. And this is kind of set in Nebraska, the Sand Hills, where it's kind of desolate. That's what I was thinking of when I wrote this. Okay, cool. There well, are actually no trains there, but I've got trains in this poem. Let's go ahead and hear The poem is... The yeah. poem is called Station. Mm -hmm. Trains, but no one gets on. No clatter, no sound. Only the sigh, sigh of endless sky. The line ever longer call. Men with hands in pockets. No wives, no children, no destinations. The still sun bleeding red begs the question, when this will end? Men with hunched shoulders gaze at the clock at the station. One lone hand locked in place. The station master appears and disappears. No reason or rhyme. An unseen whistle cries and sings a lonely song. For what is the sun without moon and dance? Good. Thanks for sharing that. That was Station by Mike Bales. Thanks, Mike. Okay, thanks. And nice talking to you. Yep, have a good day. All right, bye. Bye. That was Mike Bales with Station. And, um... Not sure. I still not sure what the news story that inspired that was. Um, it is the yesterday was the, the spring equinox, and um, also there's this whole when will this end? Anytime you see something like when will this end, you assume COVID type stuff because when will this end? Uh, let me see if we have anybody else who wanted to share so we don't miss anybody. So Maribade was the before. No callers. I think we got everybody. Jessica says, thank you for helping last Sunday. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing that poem last Sunday. Jessica, if you have a new one, 
that you've sent it on in. Um, let's see. Okay, so I think that's it. So now it is time for our Saiku. And I have to find the Saiku because that's how, you know, you can't do anything but until you find it. The Saiku for this week was based on this article right here, which I will try to pull up. Here we go. This is from, I don't even know, who is this from? This is from um, Stanford University. But what lab is it? The Lentic Lab at Stanford University. And so here we go. This is a... This is the article that I found interesting this week. This was How Hummingbirds Hum. And um, it's really amazing. Let me show, maybe I'll show a little bit of this video too. This is, um, if we can play some of it. And you see it's from Saroma and TUE and Stanford University. And um, How Hummingbirds Hum. And what, what, I'll put on this background music just a Whenever little bit. You walk outside. Oh, they're talking. Never mind. So, um, yeah. So what? What this article did is they they took um, twelve uh, twelve high definition cameras, super high speed cameras. They took two thousand one hundred and seventy six microphones, an array of them, and what they called a um, a what do they call it a, a a sound camera, I think is what they called it. And then they took six specialized pressure plates and they did all this just to figure out how a hummingbird hums and what it is about the sound that makes it do it, you know? And, um, and yeah, so, so here's this lab, this lab setup. They had this hummingbird in here with all these cameras and all of these um, and sound cameras and pressure plates to, to make this map, like a heat map, of where the sound is coming from and when. And the fascinating thing about it is that um, how much work, really, went into it, how many cameras, and then they had to take so much data, just terabytes and terabytes of data, and, and organize it all together to make a map of how, um, how, how the sounds fit together and how they were being produced. And... Uh, and they needed to take an AI algorithm just to process the data, which took years to do in addition to all these cameras. And what was, what was interesting, not in, you know, they, they, this, what they were able to model was um, the, the way hummingbirds' wings kind of, instead of going up and down, they go back and forth. And so basically that when they flap, they're producing sound twice. It's sort of on the forward and the back. They're both making these pressure waves that are going back and forth, oscillating. And it's producing sound that way, whereas a regular bird, when it flaps, only has a pressure at the bottom of the wing. They have pressure on both sides, so it kind of goes back and forth and makes this humming sound like an insect does. It's the same way an insect's wings work. And, um, but, but what was fascinating about this was just how much effort and how much work went into it and how many like, technologies had to be designed to just to model this hummingbird sound that they did. And um, it, it goes to show, like, like people always make fun of um, the ridiculous things that scientists um, study. But, but what it allows is you to, you know, you have questions that you need solving. It propels people to find solutions to figure these things out. And eventually what this will end up doing is, is massively advancing this um, um, sound camera technology and the ability to figure out how sounds are made and eventually make drones much quieter as they're flying and appliances hum less. You know, if the power goes out, you don't really notice the background hum, but there's so much hum in the background. And, um, and, and so, so this, this company is going to be working on ways to make appliances quieter and make our lives quieter from all this background noise that we're constantly bathing in. And uh, it's just an interesting thing, but interesting look at how much work goes into um, just, just science these days. And uh, so check this out with the uh, high-tech sound camera and all this. This is at tue.nl. I'm not even sure what that is. Endoven University of Technology is one of the partners, along with Stanford. And um, you can find this, this, if you can find this video, it is worth watching. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes or something. So here is the Saiku about it, though. Here we go. Hummingbird, heavy in the field of sound. Hummingbird, heavy in the field of sound. And that is your Saiku for today. Uh, thanks so much for being a, a guest and sharing your poems. 
And uh, thanks so much to everybody who called in and, and is watching. It's always fun to do these. I uh, really appreciate you being here. Let's show you what is going to be up coming up on the Rattlecast. Um, this week's guest is going to be Lois Bear Barr, a Chicago poet. She has a new book of poems. Uh, Biopoesis is an older book, uh, but she's going to be focusing mostly on these poems written about um, her rides on the L in Chicago. And it's a new book that's, that's forthcoming, and we'll talk about that. Um, she's also support in our neurodiversity issue. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the spring issue that is Rattlecast number 85 with Lois Bear Barr. And the prompt for this week was to write a poem in the um, in the stanzas of a uh, limerick. So write a limerick, but a serious limerick. And that's a challenge kind of that Wendy Vidalock threw out on last week's Rattlecast. She said it was, it was almost impossible to write a serious limerick. And so just because of the meter. And the meter is a funny kind of meter. And it makes you want to be funny. But we'll see if we can write any serious limericks or at least serious poems in the limerick stanza form, which you can find anywhere. Um, you know, they're, they're anapestic feet, and then lines three and four are different, and the rhymes come in. You kind of know a limerick um, when you hear it, but you can look, out the, uh, look at the pattern and then try to write a serious limerick. And that's for the open mic Tuesday, March 23rd, 9 p.m. Eastern on Rattlecast number 85 with Lois Bear Bar. We'll see you then. Hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. Goodbye.